behavior yeah. just as minutely <clears throat> as you observe those yes, I mean, wonderful sounds... passages about the sounds of the wings of the flapping geese on, on mass, but then you'll also look at the zipper on somebody's jacket. Well, I think, I mean, this was maybe sounds kind of grandiloquent, but I wanted to have, as it were, a comprehensive way of seeing the world that took on all of those things. And, um, and I do think it's an, imp an important sort of ecological uh, principle that we inc we understand that we are part of a continuum that we inhabit the same world i mean actually nature is is a realm where this phrase is slightly discredited but where it really is just true to say of nature that we're all in this together i mean there's a moment in the snow geese where there's a man who's been tracking bald eagles across north america and has gone to see them and he said he says somewhere that you know they depend on the same things that we do and if they can't make it then we sure as hell can't either i think it's what i'm saying when tony's book incredibly valuable I think articulates in a new language quite an old principle of ecology and conservation, which is the interconnectedness of all things, that we inhabit the same space. The trees also played a, a, mm. a big role in your writing and also in the way that you see this interrelation of, of man and nature. You mm. wrote a wonderful paper, Why the Ash Has Black Buds, for a book for the Woodland Trust, which is the trees become aware of what they're used for, from stockades to joists and beams and chess pieces and books. And I, and I started reading it thinking, oh, this is going to be one of those please don't cut down the trees, you know, sort of yeah. <laughs> German sort of green thinking of the 1970s, mm. that the wood is dying. Yeah. But actually, you go somewhere very different with it. You go to much more positive conclusion about what the tree is doing for us and that it's part of our everyday life even if we're not standing in a forest yes and i well i'm particularly um attached to trees and excited by trees i mean um and tony touched on it actually i think one of the things i love about trees is that at, when you plant a tree you're thinking about time in a different way when you plant a tree, you're actually directly implicated in what the world is going to feel like and look like in 100 years' time or 200 years' time. And maybe that goes to what John was talking about, about the clash of timescales. Yes. The sort of profits that Tony are talking about coming from nature may take a long time mm. to play out, whereas the kind of profits mm. that businesses are looking for and maybe politicians mm. look for in their five yearly cycles mm. happen on a much shorter timescale. And it may be that part of the problem is that we need to change our... Mm understanding of time. Mm. Tony, you're, you're nodding vigorously. Yes, yeah, so, and, 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 in, and in large part that then in turn comes down to the extent to which we value certain aspects of nature which we can see in the market and other values which are hugely valuable economically which are not yet visible in the market. Mm. And so a forest will naturally be seen as a source of timber mm. but less often is it seen as a source of water a way of capturing carbon dioxide or a repository of biological diversity, which in the future could be hugely valuable in medicine, mm. engineering and design and everything else. And it's about leaping that schism into mm. un understanding that wider set of values and bringing them into uh, policy. And this is where it gets tricky, actually. And, and Nair is right, you know, in the extent to which um, there is a, a, a difference between, on the one hand, valuing nature and then finding the mechanisms to reflect that value in how we do business. Mm -hmm. And so some of the things that we've done for quite a long time are quite familiar. Uh, for example, <coughs> national parks and, and uh, restricting certain chemicals being released into the environment. We do that through regulation and through decisions made by government. But if we're going to capture this wider set of values, then there is some quite controversial uh, discussion to be had. There's some controversial choices there in the sense of, you know, do we do payments for ecosystem services? Do we do biodiversity offsetting and these kinds of well, tools? Uh, at least you, 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 you mentioned payments and offsetting. Now, you see, this is a kind of language which for some people takes them quite a long way from why they value nature in the first place, mm. uh, whatever the, the, the pros and cons of, of Tony's case. And as a writer and as someone, as you say, who wanted to go back to that, that more integral connection between man and nature, do you regret to an extent the fact that the debate has moved or has had to move in this direction where it does sound a bit pound shilling and pence? Well, I would regret it if that was the only language we mm. spoke. And I, I don't think Tony wants that to be the only language we speak. I don't think any of us would. But it's something I notice as well in the art Ha, ha, do have to do the same thing. Um, increasingly, it's not enough to say that our imagination, our creativity is a wonderful thing. We should be pouring public saying, resources mm. into that. The arts have to make the same economic case. But they run into the same difficulty that sometimes when they put on big figures on things, that they you then end up in this argument about whether Nairis has got a finger mm. up in the air here. I mean, whether the projections are correct. So you end up in this slightly grad grindish argument. <coughs> well, I don't think they're so far away. I love William's expression, exercises in paying attention, because I think 
actually probably that's what the numbers are trying to do is grab attention. And I think there is this more profound and inspiring way to do it, mm. which is through writing like Williams. And I, I loved the way in your work, William, um, the other paying attention that, that, that you're doing, which is taking your first story work into schools, because it's, it's the same thing. In other words, what, what he's seeing through his work getting quite excluded young children to mm. think about and tell their own story is getting them to pay attention to themselves mm. and then seeing mm. the impacts of that on literacy. And, you know, so you could, a different approach and one very popular in development is to think about things like conditional payments. So let's pay the child or pay the parent for achieving certain levels. And that is one way to do it. But I think what he's on to is a very different way that has a quiet and surprising rate of success. Well, I think that, um, I'm so glad to hear that, but I, I think that um, certainly in the what I do with First Story, which is promoting creativity and promoting writing in challenging secondary schools, really, and, and I was thinking about that a lot reading Tony's book, because one of the nice things about it is the way he spotlights people doing very inventive and creative things, from the team in Cambridge making a solar-powered car to the people who, who worked out the biosphere experiment, which is extraordinary, um, to the very conscientious and rather surprising way that PG Tips has grown in East Africa, mm. I think it was. Um, yes, I mean, there are some brilliant things in there, and I, I was thinking if you if you were to do an economic analysis on human creativity, the calculator would just explode. Yes. And I, I mm. worry about mm. about the lack of creative opportunities in schools, which is mm. something that First Story is particularly addressing. But I do notice this language creeping into the, the arts as well. Even just last week, the playwright Lee Hall was making an amazing speech in Newcastle about the cuts to the arts budget there and the closure of libraries in Newcastle. And he started with the arguments from principle and and and, and the great sense of wonder in reading and and meeting meeting with books and meeting with imaginative experience and then he said you know for every 1.5 million spent on the arts in Newcastle it brings in 20 <laughs> million in business and tourism so right. that language is getting everywhere and I and I <laughs> what I like is seeing those those languages alongside each other and I think it's absolutely right that especially where public money is being spent and charities are asking for money mm. from donors that they're as rigorous as they can be in gathering data and monitoring and evaluating but I think if that was the only language that we all spoke yes. then we'd be very we'd, narrow people we, we, <laughs> would be, we would be diminished Indeed. we yeah, would be the poorer, totally poorer for it would, yeah. now one of the issues that goes to the heart of the debate about nature and development is of course housing and the conundrum of how do you preserve one while providing more of the other the homes that people want for themselves and for their families well last week the government suggested it would offer incentives to communities who allow housing development in their areas there's a target of around 270,000 new homes a year John Penrose is an MP indeed a former Minister of Heritage no less this is one of the choices politicians can rarely get right, isn't it? And it historically has caused more pain to seating MPs than yeah, almost any absolutely, other issue. Yes. Uh, absolutely. But one of the things I'm trying to put across is that there's an enormous amount which is good about our towns and our cities as well. And so while you're trying to strike that balance, we need to make sure that we don't lose the beauty um, and the stuff that makes our towns and cities good places to live in the process. And what we've got is towns and cities now which are most of them several centuries old and many of them very beautiful, not just in a formal way, not just in the way that you'll find if you go to Bath Royal Crescent <coughs> excuse me, or to the Mall in London, but also in an informal way. Just I'm willing to bet anybody listening to your, to your programme this morning will think of the, their local walk where they take the dog in the morning or where they take the children on a Sunday afternoon, there'll be something about it. The, the bandstand in the local park, the local town 